Hello. Very good evening, sir. I have logged in. Right, sir. Right. You are the co-host now, sir. Arun? Hello. Yeah, yeah, Hello. Sir, we can start, sir. I'm just switching on my video. One second. I'm just coming on my laptop. One second, it's coming on. Hello, Hemant, you are there? Hello, sir. I don't see Hemant anywhere, but uh... Navneet, can you contact Hemant Coil? Sir, Heman sir is joining soon, sir. No, he is only supposed to speak, no? Just call, sir. Arun, you are coordinating. Arun yeah. is not. Yeah, there. yes, no, no problem, sir. Uh, sir, Doctor Arun, uh, some family issues. I think his mother is ill. Uh, some. Okay, fine. He said he will talk with you later. मां दो मिनट छोड़ देना मेरे को जरा मीटिंग चलते हैं
Namneet, did you call up uh, Hemant? Yes, sir. He said he is joining, sir. हेलो या हेमंत वेलकम हेलो हेमंत यू जॉइन यस सर यस सर आई जॉइन सर सॉरी सर सॉरी फॉर बीइंग एक्चुअली देयर वाज सम यस अ कनेक्टिविटी इशू वाज देयर सो गुड इवनिंग एवरीबॉडी एंड वेलकम टू दिस रेसिडेंट स्मार्ट लर्निंग प्रोग्राम टुडे वी हैव डॉक्टर हेमंत गोयल हु इज द प्रोफेसर एंड हेड ऑफ द डिपार्टमेंट एट Ramonar Lohia Hospital in New Delhi. Uh, he would be talking on vesicular vaginal fistula, which is also an important topic for the residents. Because uh, in the female urology, this is one of the cases which would definitely be kept for discussion. In the uh, theory, you will have questions regarding this. So I would now invite uh, Dr. Arvind Panda, who is the board member. Of the Indian School of Urology to introduce Dr. Hemant Goel and that moderate decision. Over to you, Dr. Arvin. Dr. Arvin, I said you mute, muted. It's 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 my absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Hemant Goel. I have known Hemant Goel for uh, for months for quite some time. He is now um, professor and he is the head of department of uh, of. Ramon or Loya Hospital in New Delhi and the associated uh, PGM are there, and he has he is a, a keen interest not only in reconstructive urology and also in oncology, and in reconstructive urology he has uh, had several uh, he and his team has had several innovations including in female urethral uh, uh, reconstructive surgery and and also particularly in vesicular vaginal fistula. VVF being a very important topic, not only from the point of view of examination, also on the way it affects the lady in question. Because once she leaks and uh, and she smells of urine, the husband and the family tend to leave her. So it's a very important topic, and uh, we are we are very keen to know to know what uh, Dr. Hemant will uh, speak on this topic. Over to you, Dr. Hemant. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks a lot, uh, Keshav sir. Thanks a lot, Arvind sir. um for having me here so uh, today we will speak on uh, aspects of genital urinary fistula and uh, you already told we have in rml because of nikhil sir was there so we have uh, keen interest in specially female reconstructive surgery so i'll just uh, with your permission i'll share the screen and uh, okay i think my, my ppt is visible Yes, it's very visible. Please, please, please carry on. So, sir, uh, the the scope of the uh, as this is for residents. So, we will I will try to cover uh, basically what I have been told uh, vesicular vaginal fistula. Uh, the basically how the patient patient present, how simply we can diagnose the patient and we can avoid unnecessary investigation. And uh, again, I will focus on management. Uh, when to manage? When to intervene? in uh, immediately uh, intraoperatively immediate post operative period or uh, what we do routine bvf surgery when to do and uh, then which route we should prefer being a more of a vaginal reconstructive surgeon i'll be a bit biased about the vaginal bvf repair and then we have some short videos where we can see the technique and the marshall flap so this is how i would like to cover this topic Uh, uh so uh, the topics which are already covered in books i'll just rush through 
like genito in fistula what we are talking about is generally acquired fistula it can be obstetric or it can be gynecological uh, genito urinary fistula these are the common fistula the commonest being the vesico vaginal fistula then uncommonly there can be urethro vaginal fistula and there can be utero vesical fistula urethro vaginal fistula but what commonly we see after in our practice is a vesico vaginal fistula etiology also differs in different part of the world it can be the most common what we see nowadays is a, a gynecological after a gynecological surgery so it's like a developed world 75% of uh, bladder injury from gynecological uh, uh, surgeries we see uh, vvf uh, uh, like uh, 10 years back we were seeing most of uh, obstructed labor injury complex uh, even now in developing world it is mostly from prolonged obstructed labor because of uh, non availability of good medical care this is the entire list of invest uh, of uh, etiology which can lead to a vesico um, uh, vaginal fistula or uh, injury leading to vesico vaginal fistula the what are the causes of vvf after pelvic surgery so they uh, this we should know because we often get call from our gynae resident or gynae consultant and they say that uh, they are suspicious of a uh, bladder injury but they don't know because of a complicated pelvic surgery they are just suspicious so what what are the causes causes can be a unrecognized cystotomy it can be a tissue necrosis from cautery or it can be uh, because of bleeding they have just taken a suture through the bladder so uh, these are some of the injury which we should look when we are being called from a uh, gynae side whether it I, either the bladder is open or there can be a tissue necrosis from the cautery so that thing we should always uh, thoroughly inspect while we while, while we have been called uh, in their surgery very important as a post obstructed uh, vvf this is very common injury that is a obstructed labor injury complex a special mention because this is not a simple vvf this is generally a complex vvf and because of the obstructed labor the area which is colored blue is the first to undergo ischemic necrosis which is usually the trigone area bladder neck area and, pro and proximal urethra so it will be a large vvf the bladder neck proximal urethra entire trigone is uh, gone in this commonly we require a abdomino perineal approach um, both the approach from both the side to go, do this also this is the entire spectrum of obstructed labor injury complex it can range from a simple vvf to uh, uh, what i have already described to rectal injury a lot of thing can happen in this obstructed labor injury complex as a resident uh, we should know actually what is happening so basically uh, when we take history these are usually females from poor poor socio economic status and they have limited social roles they are usually subjected to early marriage and child bearing occurs before pelvic growth is complete which leading to a cephalo pelvic disproportion and there they are usually there is a lack of access to emergency obstetric services and which lead to obstructed labor so when we take history when we see such type of complex vvf in history it is very important to know the uh, we we already know that the patient is from a low socio economic status we should ask about the uh, 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 the age of marriage would be generally early in this patient, sort of patient then they have early child bearing they do they they usually don't wait for two or three years after six months they become pregnant so there is the early child bearing the female is thin lean short stature female and there is a cephalo pelvic disproportion and they, in in our village there is lack of emergency obstetric services so this is generally the the problem which should be reflected in a history when we take history of such patient and then the the rest part is theoretical the obstetric labor injury one is once it happened it's happened then we have to evaluate and we have to manage so how can we prevent this obstetric fistula so uh, again the prevention part like psm we have to tell about the primordial prevention primary prevention and secondary prevention primordial and pr primary is actually very important but it is more of the job of primary health care the government to in to improve the girls education to increase the age of marriage a nutritious diet should be provided during childhood prevent primary prevention in the form of better health care strategy to make motherhood safer good antenatal care watchful progress of labor and there should be trained birth attendant and transportation in case of any complicated obstetric labor is there so there should be a good transportation and provision of emergency obstetric care 
what uh, we can do is more of secondary prevention as a obstetrician gynecological there should be early recognition of cpd there should be prevention of obstetric labor in uh, if if a uh, uh, obstetrician they call that they are suspicious of obstetric labor so uh, they should not they, because they in the gyne people they have a very habit of removing uh, catheter and drain very very quickly in our setup also so you should advise them if, even if they have suspicious they should keep the catheter for long period at least for 7 to 10 days if they are suspecting any injury or uh, obstetric labor if fistula formation is suspected after obstetric labor insert an indwelling catheter and start close drainage you ensure a high fluid intake early mobilization and after 7 to 10 days you reexamine the patient before removing the catheter so this is very important and uh, this can prevent a substantial amount of um, uh, fistulas to happen now what are the prevention of surgical fistula this is also very important because there should be adequate exposure during their surgery it should minimize the Uh, we should min minimize bleeding okay, and hematoma formation. Wide mobilization of bladder should be there. If there is any suspicion of uh, bladder injury and you are being called, like if, uh, if, uh, I told to write means uh, PCN time. I think uh, yeah. So uh, this is again this is a the first three lines are more of important for a gynecological resident or a gynecological consultant consultant. But by it, when we are being called. as a surgeon as a urologist when we they call us that there are suspicion of a bladder injury it is very important to properly inspect the distended bladder so uh, what we can do is we can do a uh, intra op filling of bladder we can do perform the perirethral catheter by a, a colored agent like methylene blue along with normal saline and when we can see for any small leak which can be repaired on table if there is any uh, if the injury has occurred from uh, like there is a sharp cut we can simply close it if there is a tissue a pottery injury then we should dissect that area and then we should properly repair uh, two layer repair should be done also if you are unable to see any proper rent we should do cystic urethroscopy we should be completely satisfied uh, satisfied on table that there is uh, an, an injury or there is no injury and if there is any injury we should uh, properly repair it because that is that is the best time to prevent as well as to manage Uh, for 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 recurrence for prevention of this fistula. Now the vesical vaginal fistula, as I have already told, it is the most commonly acquired fistula. Uh, first repair, successful repair was in 1882, which was a trans vaginal approach, and in 1882 it was the first successful trans abdominal approach. Uh, now the second, the first part is the etiology of the VVF. The second part is when the patient comes to you. so uh, this is a straight forward case because the patient will have some history of of obstetric history or gynecological history and there will be a continuous leakage of urine through vagina so uh, the history is often straight forward there are some differential diagnosis like stress urinary incontinence a co existent um, uh, urethrovaginal fistula that generally we can make out from the history a, a, a simple uh, obstetric or gynecological procedure history of long catheter drainage history of uh, continuous leakage of urine these are the common history and this is, it is generally a short case and straight forward case what is more important is how to investigate how to examine this patient so whenever the patient a female with this history and continuous incontinence of urine comes to our opd most important is a good per speculum examination it is not a just a per vaginal examination the most important is a per speculum examination which can be done easily in a, uh, in a opd so that can tell us about the location of fistula the size of fistula how many number of fistula are there quality of vaginal mucosa and condition of our surrounding skin that is very important because this will help us to guide further investigation whether we can do a vaginal repair whether we can uh, we we are unable to do vaginal repair and we are uh, counsel the patient for abdominal repair this all can be guided by a per speculum examination so if on a per speculum examination we are able to locate fistula that there is a fistula so now we are sure it is a vesico vaginal fistula so second investigation will be a good cystoscopy plus vaginoscopy that is what is all required generally in a case of simple vesico vaginal fistula a good per speculum examination and if you are able to isolate the fistula a good cystoscopy and vaginoscopy 
the most fistulas are at the anterior vaginal wall at the level of cuff a sign of induration inflammation should always be seen because if there is sign of inflammation and induration then we should wait until the surrounding vaginal mucosa is healthy then only we should intervene <clears throat> now diagnosis i have already told is uh, on basis of physical examination there are some adjuvant and cystoscopy and vaginoscopy now there are some adjuvant tests the resident is usually conf confused because these are the tests which are commonly asked but they are really performed in practical so like catheter test methylene blue test motive modified methylene blue test double dye test to me uh, the they are uh, we these tests are hardly done what you should know is when you should perform this test so in a opd if a patient comes to me with a typical history of vvf on physical examination i am not able to locate the fistula on a good perspiculum examination i am doubtful whether it is a fistula or small opening so i am i am really doubtful whether it is vvf or stress urinary incontinence that time i can for a very small fistula which is not visible on a perspiculum examination or so in that case we can make use of these clinical tests like methylene blue test we can just retrograde fill with the help of a catheter uh, you, uh, saline plus methylene blue and ask the patient to strain if there is if there is uh, uh, discoloration in the vaginal cavity that means it is a small vvf so this is this is a test only uh, we can uh, opd or bedside test to uh, to die. we are sure that there, it is a vvf second uh, double dye test or triple dye test which we do to differentiate a vvf from urethrovaginal fistula with modern test available like ct urography ivu they are rarely required but for for uh, like academic reason we can uh, we can uh, read about this test radiological test are again very infrequently required especially mcq that is a substitute for me it is a substitute of methylene blue test you can take oblique images you can do a uh, mcu and we can we are able to uh, I, uh, like identify a very small vvf if it is not uh, visible on examination again mcu and ct cystography go hand in hand for a bladder uh, imaging in case a routine physical examination or a uh, cystoscopy is not able to properly delineate a fistula and same way upper tract imaging in the form of ultrasound ivu ct urography and mr urography they are for upper tract imaging to see any associated urethrovaginal fistula so so the important part is first to diagnose with the help of perspiculum examination plus cystoscopy and vaginoscopy so we don't want any other test in majority of the cases if we are we are not sure about the vvf then we will make use of a bedside bedside test like methylene blue test or a invasive test like mcu or ct cystography so these are optional tests for upper tract imaging in a otherwise uncomplicated vasico uh, vaginal fistula we can we can do either ultrasound ivu ct urography or mr urography to see for any associated urethrovaginal fistula which may be present in 10 to 20% of the cases so this is the description of a methylene blue test you all must be knowing uh, from your book textbook so uh, the more important part is a good cystoscopy so generally this question is asked why do you want to do cystoscopy so cystoscopy there are some specific points again you want to know the site of fistula you want to know the size of fistula you want to know the number of fistula you want to know the uh, proximity of the fistula to urethric orifice second thing is you want to know the condition of bladder neck any associated uh, you you can see a flux of urine from the both the urethric orifice that almost rules out any associated urethrovaginal fistula also the um, uh, the margin of the fistula the the condition of the bladder wall mucosa surrounding the fistula so if there is any bullous edema around the fistula that means it is a immature fistula and this is not the right time to operate the right time to operate is when we see a mature fistula which is a variable size fistula with smooth margins like here we can see a mature fistula but sometimes uh, the patient is on catheter for two months he is on catheter after a, a surgery and a, some gynecologist has just put a catheter and she, it will it, there is it is there for two months so what we do first is we remove the catheter because that catheter tip and balloon is irritating the fistula and it is not allowing the fistula to mature because there will be a lot of bullous edema around the fistula what we want is we want this we want a plain fistula with smooth margin so that is the right time we can operate the patient 
biopsy obviously is required in case of there is any history of malignancy the patient was operated for some malignancy we have to look for histopathology of that malignancy and before operating we should take my margin uh, biopsy from fistula margin <clears throat> this i have already told upper tract imaging concomitant ureteral injury present in 10 to 15 percent of the cases we can do ultrasound we can do uh, ivu ct urography whatever we can we can ct urography is generally preferred if you suspect any urethrovaginal fistula so this i have al also i have told that when there is a this is very important because like sequence of events the residents are often confused with this table like they don't remember this table but, but whenever we ask in any exam like in fistula what will you do they will say we will they are confused about mcu ct cystography so generally what you have to say is when there is a typical patient of vvf due to urine leakage what you will do you will take a good history that i have already told and you do a good physical examination with per specular mirror examination you just omit this this diet test which is given in campbell we should not say the about this diet test this diet test so it should actually come here vcug cystography and diet test because these are the investigation for very small vasicovaginal fistula which are missed on physical examination so you have to first give a good history and a physical examination with per specular mirror examination if once it is located then you have to do cystoscopy and you have to manage the, uh, uh, vvf after doing after after uh, uh, excluding a urethrovaginal fistula by doing a upper tract imaging if you are not able to locate the fistula that may that may be a very small uh, vvf or it may be a uvf in that case you do uh, investigation which will differentiate a small vvf from uvf that is a diet test or vcug or ct cystography so if you are able to found a small vvf again you will do a cystoscopy and you will repair it and if you are not able to find you will see other causes of urethrovaginal fistula or other causes of continuous urine leakage like urinary incontinence vaginitis and you will manage accordingly i think this uh, protocol is uh, uh, very clear because it is very simple to understand but this these sort of chart usually uh, complicate when you do uh, when you read just before exam so just uh, just you have to do a good history good physical examination and these three investigation diet test vcug and cystography for for very small fistula which are missed on physical examination this and for upper tract you can do any of ct rgp iv i think just uh, minutes okay so uh, the, uh, again once your investigation is complete so uh, theoretically you should classify your fistula as at uh, simple or complex fistula this is the entire ch uh, chart given in any of the book what is more important for me is uh, i'll i'll repair all my simple fistula from vaginal uh, repair and complicated fistula mostly from abdominal route so for 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 me to label complicated fistula it is more important if it is the ureters are involved so you need a concomitant urethrovaginal surgery uh, for concomitant uretic reimplantation and second thing is a uh, if there is a prior uh, failed attempt of vaginal repair or prior failed attempt of abdom abdominal repair so that will guide me a second repair should be from a separate um, uh, route and third thing is you have to see for a bladder capacity if it is very small then a concomitant augmentation may be required then again you have to go for a abdominal repair so this you can know but the important part is involvement of ureter capacity of bladder and previous failed attempt then the size is, is again uh, you can say less than four more than four but it is subjective of surgeon expertise one who is expert like this this thing we should not say much in exam because if i am doing from vaginal route for me 4 cm or 5 cm may not matter but if someone is not doing most of the surgery from abdominal route even 2 cm may matter so this is uh, not very absolute but if it, there is involvement of ureter everybody will do abdominal repair if there is a very small capacity bladder we will do from the from abdominal repair if there are number uh, previous failed vaginal surgery i'll prefer the abdominal repair open laparoscopic or robotic so these these things are more important now the the what you have classified the treatment goals are sedation of urine leak and it return so we have to do a successful repair return of normal and complete genital function so uh, and lessen the physical and psychological impact so second second uh, the second and third point is the vaginal capacity should be maintained and it should be repaired as soon as possible 
as soon as practically possible because that will uh, decrease the physical and psychological impact to the female which is already stressed low socio economic status and um, now now she has to do all the household work she is uh, isolated so that has to be taken care but not at the cost of successful repair there are some controversies in uh, management of vbf one is time of repair we will try to address that use of estrogen and antibiotic route of repair excision of tract interposition graft because again as if, as exam when you reach till this time then we are uh, then uh, then the uh, the examiner will ask you whether you will do a vaginal repair abdominal repair and you are generally stuck you you don't know whether now now the, when you look after this chart like uh, it is very confusing so when uh, it is a simple fistula it is a complicated fistula so uh, you should know what is the time so we'll discuss about the time of repair whether you use estrogen and where you use estrogen the route of repair excision of tract like um, it is again confusing a uh, campbell in vaginal they have written uh, they don't excise in abdominal they have written excise so we'll 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 see why they have written this interposition graft whether to use or not so early versus late repair so only in in a intraoperative injury or immediately post operative injury very selected cases you will go for a early repair if there is a bladder injury so uh, repair as soon as possible in iatrogenic or post surgery vvf if diagnosed within 48 hours but this is generally not the scenario the patient we get a call usually after 3 or 4 days they have done something something and then they call us after 4 or 5 days that there is some leakage so then generally that window is lost and uh, what we generally do is a uh, uh, elective repair but if you call get call after 24 hours and you know that there is a rent in bladder you can within 48 hours you can go back and can repair the best is the intraoperative repair if it is possible so early repair otherwise is not indicated in obstructed fistula so obstructed fistula ischemic fistula and we generally do a uh, uh, elective repair in this patient so classically we do it 3 months after the uh, surgery and in case of radiation vvf we wait for 6 to 12 months shortening the wait, uh, waiting period is very important for totally wet patient but we should not trade social inconvenience for compromise surgical success pre operative consideration is should uh, like i already told you the tissue should be free of infection inflammation and cancer broad spectrum antibiotic especially when early repair is contemplated and estrogen replacement in post menopausal patient or post cystectomy fistula are recommended now the route of repair again this depend more important it is depend on the access to the fistula side mobility of the vagina vagina and surgeon expertise so whenever uh, in exam they ask you about route of repair repair this is what you want to i think you should emphasize because you don't know your three examiners like two external examiners whether they are a good vaginal surgeon or they are good laparoscopic or robotic surgeon or robotic or laparoscopic so so you don't know about this so don't go into controversy you should you should just say it depends on the uh, surgeon expertise for me a, a supra trigonal fistula is no contraindication so any supra trigonal fistula for like it it will be differ, different for different surgeon for me all vaginal all all vvf i will repair from vaginal side unless Uh, i matlab i am not able to on on examination we can repair all type of fistula except if the uretic even if it is close to uretic orifice if the uretic orifice is involved then only i'll operate operate from above if there is a failed vaginal repair in my hand then i'll do if there is a failed vaginal repair from outside we'll again do a vaginal repair but if there is a failed vaginal repair from my hand then i'll do a abdominal repair and second thing if it is a obstetric fistula with a very small capacity i'll preferably counsel the patient for a abdominal perineal repair i'll do it from both the side so uh, this is what is more important uh, you, if you say just it is a supra trigonal fistula i'll do from abdominal side i don't think that is true in today's uh, time if it is a post hysterectomy vvf even if it is supra trigonal we can easily repair it from uh, vaginal side so there is no strict criteria which it it basically depend on surgeon expertise there are few absolute indication of abdominal repair rest on can all rest all can be done from vaginal side depending on surgeon expertise so this is what i answer i think i'll give in my exam if asked about the route of repair transvaginal approach 
uh, we at the advantage disadvantage we all, all know that transvaginal approach as advantage are avoidance of laparotomy it is a shorter operating time hardly half an hour we take early recovery short stay minimum post op pain minimum blood loss it avoids the opening of bladder we can do concomitant anti incontinent surgery and if a failed subsequent approach is not compromised disadvantage it is a small space risk, risk of inadequate closure due to less space uh, there is a learning curve to uh, vaginal approach vaginal shortening can be there but generally not a problem in uh, our patient in our follow up but a uh, uretic re the important thing is uretic reimplant augmentation cystoplasty is not possible if required so that is the absolute indication for abdominal repair trans abdominal approach the disadvantage of vaginal approach are advantage of trans abdominal approach you can do a ureter vaginal fistula concomitant a complex uh, fistula can be involving other organ can also be dealt augmentation cystoplasty can be done complicated fistula multiple attempt large fistula more than 5 cm can be done and combined at the general transfer of donal approach can be done so route of repair uh, in summary it depend mostly on surgeon training and experience we generally repair by vaginal route uh, route and we reserve abdominal approach for selected patient like i have already told small bladder capacity radiation fistula and uh, um, uh, concomitant ureter vaginal or ureteric injury now the excision of tract versus no excision so classical teaching was we excise the tract but it now challenge and not widely followed advantage of not excising the tract is a smaller defect to repair which is especially important in a vaginal uh, route because already the space is less if i excise the tract that defect will be more and uh, the the tension free repair may be difficult there is because we don't excise the tract so there is less bleeding uh, bleeding may be uh, from freshly excised margin may require coagulation further damage if near urethrovesical junction excision of tract may require reimplantation so if we don't excise reimplantation may be avoided and there is a small uh, strong fibrous ring of tract which provide strength to suture line so uh, in summary what i uh, prefer is in a vaginal route i don't excise tract and it is not even written in books to excise tract so in vaginal when we do a vaginal vvf repair we don't excise um, the, uh, this uh, the fibrous ring but in case of abdominal repair we because there is a wide mobilization of bladder already we can easily excise the tract we can do better closure so so that is possible uh, can be done easily so uh, in a open vvf repair abdom trans abdominal repair we can do excision of the tract but it is not essential can be we can manage uh, we can have good results equivalent results even without excision of tract the advantage i have already uh, described now the interposition flap again it there is a controversy so uh, when we we have started the vaginal repair program so in most of the cases we were doing a interposition flap now in most of our cases we are we are not doing interposition flap so uh, basically because most are uncomplicated fistula so most uncomplicated fistula they just require a good multi layer tension free repair interposition flap we generally use when they are complicating factors like it is the radiation fistula there is a prior failed surgery there is poor quality of tissue especially the perivesical tissue if it is a poor quality we can have in place of that we can have a interposition flap or there is a urethrovaginal fistula in all cases of urethrovaginal fistula we will have a interposition flap so in, in a otherwise uncomplicated fistula we don't need any interposition flap but, but in cases where there is a poor tissue quality there is a, a urethrovaginal fistula there is a post radiation and prior failed surgery we will use a interposition flap uh, what interposition flap we use we generally use marshall flap in case of urethral and trigeminal fistula now that we should know that a marshall flap has a sufficient length a particular length so it can cover the urethra because it is coming from below so it can cover the urethra and trigeminal part but if we want to do cover the vault of the vagina generally the marshall flap will not easily go till there so we avoid marshall flap for a vaginal vault fistula there instead we will take we what we easily we can take we can take peritoneum or we can take omentum because already we have, it is in the vault fistula the are usually post hysterectomy fistula so there is no uterus there is a peritoneum attached to the vault of vagina so we can just open it and we can easily bring peritoneum or omentum if the peritoneum get open we can easily bring omentum and we can use in higher fistula we can use peritoneum and omentum if we are doing a vaginal vvf repair 
and in our trigonal fistula or urethral fistula, urethrovaginal fistula, we can easily use, make use of Marshall's flap. For abdominal repair, we can use peritoneum or omentum, which is easily available. For more complicated fistula like radiation fistula, we should make use of more robust interposition flap like Grashelis flap. So uh, uh, basically, when we are talking uh, of uh, the management, the first is the conservative management. Uh, which is hard, the most important part of the small fistula less than one centimeter and diagnosed within seven days. Most important thing I have already told is a long indwelling cataphorization. Also, you can give anticholinergic for two to three weeks. That is what we follow. If we get a call, for, uh, call from gynae, we don't try to intervene at that point of time. We don't do any coagulation, cauterization, anything because that will further damage the best trial can be with a good indwelling catheterization and anticholinergic for two to three weeks and then hope for the best even after three weeks if there is any leakage we will have to wait and we repair after three uh, three months uh, medical management i have already told you these are some of the non-surgical intervention which have been described as a part of conservative management but they hardly work and in our experience um, uh, they have a very uh, Failure rates for just for theoretical reason, I'll mention it here. Practically, we don't follow it. Now, uh, surgical repair, there is no, like we have tell, no, no surgical approach is best. The best, but the best opportunity for a successful repair is the initial surgery. So, whatever best is for that patient, whatever best is in the hand of that surgeon, that should be done because the first repair is the best time when the patient can have successful repair. The basic principle of obstetric fistula repair are, we all know, broad mobilization of the fistula so that it can be closed without tension at the site of repair. Watertight closure of the injury, adequate bladder emptying in the post-operative period so that suture line does not overstand. So adequate bladder uh, emptying again can be done with a simple uh, periurethral catheter good size. We can additionally put a suprapubic catheterization again. Um, uh, now we don't put suprapubic catheterization, but in your initial cases, a uh, 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 double drainage is always preferable. Preferable. Now, uh, transabdominal procedures, uh, we all know O'Connor, Landis, Gilbernet uh, procedures. So I'll just, uh, this is the pictorial representation from Campbell. This procedure we all know, we all have seen a transabdominal repair open, where we open the bladder dome. We go till the we bifurcate the bladder dome. We go till the uh, fistula. We circumscribe the fistula. We we elevate the bladder uh, wall from the vaginal vaginal wall. We ex we can do excision of the fistula, and then we repair in two layers the bladder. We close the vagina and we put a interposition of a peritoneum or omentum. So this is standard which we all know. Other techniques, this can be done laparoscopically or robotic assisted approach. With each technique, the, the amount of bladder opening will decrease. The principle will remain the same. It will be like O'Connor. A laparoscopic approach can be a transvesical approach. It can be a supravesical approach, which is more common. A laparoscopic with uh, this, this, these, they follow the principle of O'Connor. Only thing is the amount of bladder opening will be less because now we are seeing directly in the pelvis. So we don't need to open fundus, uh, the, the, the dome of the part or the anterior wall of the part. We can just open the posterior part of the part. The rest of the principle will remain same. The amount of bladder morbidity will definitely reduce. Transvaginal procedures in a narrow vault, a vaginal vault. Uh, so transvaginal procedure, there is no contraindication. A narrow vaginal vault, we can increase the exposure by uh, extending postulateral relaxing inflation. Uh, we always do cystoscopy on table prior to starting of vaginal VVF repair and if the fistula, if the, uh, the fistula is very close to uh, the ureteric orifice, then we do a ureteric cath catheter placement. Otherwise, we avoid a ureteric uh, catheter placement. We don't do a routine ureteric catheterization prior to a vaginal VVF repair. Only thing if it is very close, then we will do. Otherwise, we, we avoid it. But as a beginner, you can place ureteric catheter in all of the cases prior to attempting uh, vaginal VVF repair. Also, uh, uh, the suprapubic catheter, I have already told, it is optional. Transvaginal procedure, the two of the most common procedure are LATSCO. LATSCO is basically used for a post-hysterectomy vaginal wall fistula. Because here, there is no uterus. We can easily pull the <coughs> uh, 
fistula in the operative field because there is no uterus. So if the fistula, if you put a catheter, you can come into your field and the, the repair becomes very easy. <clears throat> and RAS is basically for a typical trigonal fistula which is and, uh, connected to anterior vaginal wall. Position of the patient is a standard lithotomy position in majority of our patient. We can all the, the other position which are described are a prone jackknife position. This is more common for a urethrovaginal fistula or uh, um, large uh, psychovaginal fistula. This uh, makes the life of surgeon, actually the life of anesthetist and patient difficult, but life of surgeon easy. So we have to trade between who you want to make comfortable. If you want to make yourself comfortable, you can have a prone uh, position. If you want to make your anesthetist comfortable, you can just have a lithotomy position. Otherwise, the procedure will be same. So this is the prone position. So I'll uh, quickly tell you about the vagina, transvaginal repair, let's go procedure. You all know it is for closure of simple post hysterectomy, vasicovaginal fistula. So this is a, a let's go procedure. Uh, very important in the vaginal repair is again a good examination, a good cystoscopy. You put a uh, basically a catheter, a 10 French or 12 French catheter through the fistula side. If by chance you are not able to uh, put a uh, 10 French or 12 French catheter, you put a guide wire, you dilate the fistula over that. And uh, so that a catheter goes into that fistula because you want to uh, uh, you want to distend the balloon of the catheter and you want to give a traction so that this fistula comes in your field. So whatever high fistula is there, it is a post hysterectomy fistula, it will come down and you can easily, with this traction, your planes are also good. So you can easily make the first incision and you can elevate these vaginal epithelium. Very important part again in fistula repair is the first thing is a good exposure in a vaginal VVF repair. Second thing is a good traction. So a good traction, a good exposure is by taking care of these stay sutures. This will give a good traction. Your catheter will go in bladder and it will be out of your field. The third thing is you put a catheter into the fistula and you could give a good traction so that the fistula comes in closer to you. The third thing is you give a, you do a good incision, circumferential incision, you elevate a vaginal epithelium. This should be in correct planes. There is a proper plane uh, which will minimize the bleeding. If you are, you make this vaginal epithelium very thin, again it will bleed and if you take, you make the incision very thick and you, uh, you go into the perivocycle tissue, then also it will bleed. If you are into right planes, it bleeds very less. So this, this first plane is very important. And this should be at least three to four centimeter adjacent to fistula margin, because here it is a fistula. Then the, uh, the, the perivocycle tissue is retracted because these are ischemic fistula, though they are retracted. So your aim is to repair, to close the fistula in first layer, to, uh, to have a good perivocycle second layer and third layer, the epithelium. And if there's an interposition flap is required, that, that as th third layer and epithelium, vaginal epithelium as fourth layer. So you take, a, you put a catheter, you go to give a good traction, circumlinear incision, make good vaginal epithelium flaps. Then you do first layer repairing. Now uh, a, a typical uh, uh, let's go procedure ends here, but in a modified let's go, we do a second layer repair also. And then we close vaginal epithelium. Try, we try this to be non-overlapping suture lines and a tension-free suture line. This is a typical RAS repair where we take an inverted U-shaped incision. So this is a typical um, uh, anterior vaginal wall epithelium where we, we have given a good exposure with the help of self-retaining retractors. This we have put a catheter through the fistula. Then again, we give a incision, a typical uh, circumferential extending posteriorly. So it will be a, like a U lip. Here it is circumferential. The posterior part, the the proximal part is uh, extended as a, as a U shape. Uh, good vaginal epithelium flap is raised at least two to four centimeter lateral to the fistula margin. Uh, it, it is very important because then we, the a good amount of perivocycle tissue should be exposed because these are lat retracted laterally in case of ischemic structure and they, these are the vascular second layer which we have to uh, we have to take in second layer so that our vascular covering to first layer is given. 
so this the, the dissection of the flap is extended at least 2 to 4 cm from the fistula sac exposing the perivesical fascia so this this step is more important and most critical for a good vvf repair it the, the vaginal flap should be at least 2 4 2 to 4 cm lateral to so that a good perivesical tissue is exposed then uh, this is also important that the after the, after a sufficient exposure you take sutures so sutures what layer you have to take so in this we take a 20 delayed absorbable suture i take a taper uh, taper point needle and including in this suture line is the whole thickness of bladder vaginal wall and con uh, connected to the fistula sac a strong bite of tissue 2 to 3 mm from the margin of the fistula is obtained so we take a strong bite 2 to 3 mm lateral to the fistula margin so it will take a bite of vaginal wall the fistula and the bladder epithelium so these all three thing will come in your fistula bite the first layer closure interrupted suture i generally prefer interrupted suture we I, first we pre place the suture and then we close the first layer now the 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 the, the second part is again very important a good perivesical tissue should be mobilized a tension free closure should be done so uh, what the second layer include so this suture include perivesical fascia and deep musculature of the bladder so you mobilize the perivesical tissue and in second layer you take a bite from the perivesical tissue plus deep musculature of the bladder so that the first layer become invaginated so these steps are actually more important than anything else in a successful vaginal repair and once you have done this either uh, you can put a omentum or peritoneal flap for a higher fistula or a marshes pad of fat for a lower fistula and then you can uh, close the you can excise the remnant of um, vaginal epithelium flap and you can close it tissue interposition again the options available to us in a transvaginal approach i have told for a low fistula like trigonal or urethrovaginal fistula i'll make use of a labial pad pad if that is deficient we can use a bulbospongiosus muscle flap for a supra trigonal fistula if i am repairing by vaginal root i'll make use of a peritoneal flap or omentral flap very rarely for radiation induced fistula we will use gracilis flap for trans abdominal approach the, the common options are omentum flap or a peritoneum flap and then uh, for com more complicated fistula for obstructed labor injury complex we can make use of these gracilis flap rectus abdominis muscle flap so this is a typical picture which uh, of uh, marshes flap this is for bulbospongiosus and muscle flap post operative care is again very important you should give a urinary antiseptic and antibiotic to the patient we should avoid infection vaginal prac is removed in after 24 hours next day of the surgery morning of the surgery in almost all the cases a prolonged indwelling catheter we keep it for 14 days cystogram is usually not required in some cases if it is actually not required and uh, the more important is you should avoid patient to have a basically first thing is the patient should be instructed to avoid over distension of bladder by timed and frequent voiding and he should she should avoid sexual intercourse for 3 months avoid pregnancy for one year this should go in your discharge sheet that should that she should avoid sexual intercourse for 3 months and pregnancy for one year and cesarean section if she is pregnant in the uh, in a, in a follow up period then the cesarean section is almost absolutely indicated this is some of the video which we have done in uh, uh, global perinicon we we organized this workshop and uh, i'll just play 23 year old so, okay so this was uh, uh, one female which we have operated which was a 23 year female uh, there was a history of uh, laparotomy records were not available history of lower segment cesarean section 3 years back there was a defect of size 2 into 1 cm and anterior vaginal wall 2 cm proximal to vaginal opening other another indication was felt at 5 cm proximal to vaginal opening there was continuous uh, urine leakage and vagina was capacious on per speculum examination there was a 2 into 1 defect this is the uh, it films so on cystoscopy there was a uh, ren 2 into 1 cm there was urethrovaginal fistula plus uh, left urethrovaginal fistula actually i think uh, yeah this is a cystoscopy finding 
I'll just omit this. I'll play one. I have one more video, which is of basico vaginal fistula. This I think uh, is of urethro uh, urethro vaginal fistula. So this is a let's go repair. This is a this I have taken. This was again operated in uh, um, uh, perineocon 2018 by Dr. Nikhil sir, and I have borrowed the video from him him only. So again, this was a post hysterectomy supra trigonal VGF. This is a uh, vaginoscope. This is the cystoscopy view. We can see the uh, guide wire coming from the bladder, and both urethral orifices well away from the um, uh, fistula side. A good bladder neck and the urethra. Now we are doing vaginoscopy, in which we have uh, negotiated the guide wire through the fistula. So now you can see there is a good exposure by taking care of uh, this um, stay suture. And by dilating the fistula, we have they have introduced the Foley's catheter. So this was a very high fistula, but with good stay suture and good traction, you can easily bring the fistula near to you, and then that, that uh, ninety percent of your problem is solved. Then a good incision should be taken lateral to the fistula margin. It should be deep enough. So that a good vaginal epithelium can flap can be raised. Only two instrument is required: a good knife and a good medicine bomb scissor. Generally, avoid using sharp instrument which traumatize uh, the vaginal epi epithelium. So this is the way you have to create vaginal epithelium. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. So you can see, uh, just by everything has to be here sharp dissection. There is no blunt dissection. By one hand, we are giving traction on the fistula, so that is helping in creating vaginal. Uh, epithelium flap, and it should be at least two to four centimeter lateral to the fistula margin. Once we have done this, and a good perivascular tissue is visible, what we do is we take a pre-placed sutures, which include the vaginal part, the fistula part, and the bladder epithelium. So you can do it horizontally, or you can do it any way. Generally, what you can do is you can, either you can place all the three sutures, or you can take two sutures at two margin. You can remove the catheter, and then with the help of these two sutures, you can do give traction and center sutures. You can take later on because with catheter, it, it is difficult to take the center sutures. So once we have taken these sutures, you remove the catheter and you tie the first layer. So uh, this can be done anyway. Like like what I prefer is I I remove the catheter. I take sutures from both the ends. We remove the catheter. Then we take the center, like like like. Uh, now he is taking the the margin sutures are taken, and now the central suture are uh, is being taken, and that will involve the entire wall of the entire fistula, uh, vaginal epithelium, and bladder epithelium. Then these three place sutures are uh, tied. So first layer, attention free first layer is repaired. The second is you have to take a good perivascular tissue. In case of let's go, it's not required that much. But in case of RAS, you give, uh, you uh, you take a 
good second layer repair is done and then vaginal epithelium after after redundant vaginal epithelium is excised then we repair vaginal epithelium and then we do vaginal packing which is remove, removed after 24 hours and catheter after 14 days So this is after after repair. We uh, they have shown the cystoscopy that they, and there is no leakage. So this is not routinely done. This is all only for demonstration purpose. In my last video, I will just show the Marshall flap because that is urethrovaginal fistula. But they uh, in there we, uh, we have taken Marshall flap. Again, this was operated in uh, Perineocon 2018. So from here, this is the. So this is the Marshall flap uh, video. So this this procedure is done when we have repaired the first and second layer. That is, we have closed the fistula. We have taken the second layer. That is the perivascular tissue. We also we have closed. Now we will harvest the Marshall's flat pad. Incision is taken. With blunt dissection of the finger, we can actually. Uh, loop this uh, Marshall fat pad and it can be inferior based or superior based. Generally, we take inferior based. So, we avoid in uh, nowadays we avoid in uncomplicated fistula because again, this gives us scar to the patient and it is it can cause significant seromas also, collection also, they can be secondary infection. So it should be done only when it is indicated to make a tunnel through sub, sub epithelial root. Now this the you can you can see the length of the Marshall flap is not that great that it will go all the way till the vaginal vault. So generally we uh, reserve this for urethrovaginal fistula and for uh, trigonal uh, vasicovaginal fistula. But for post hysterectomy or a very high fistula, uh, it is insufficient. So we generally don't use for that fistulas. This is how we uh, do Marshall flap. And then we close the wound here with a Penrose vein and we uh, take some packing suture and then we close the vaginal epithelium. So uh, basically that is all from my side. And uh, just I'll stop sharing. Yeah. So uh, hopefully, hopefully it was a bit informative, and uh, uh, we can have some. Sir, I think uh, over to you, Keshav. We can have some interaction with residents. Their with their doubts can be cleared. Sir, you, sir, you are uh, uh, mute. Okay. Yeah. So. Uh, uh, Arvind sir or Kesha sir, sir, we can have or any anybody, any resident or any anybody participant who can who wish to have any question, it's now open to question. We can we can discuss. We have some time. If you are not able to understand anything or uh, you have any doubt, we can just uh, interact for some time. Uh, Arvind sir, or Keshav sir, Dr. Keshav sir. Yeah, that's absolutely a wonderful uh, presentation uh, by Dr. Hemant. He covered everything, I think. It was very comprehensive. And uh, and absolutely, I mean, uh, it was absolutely covered everything. Did that? I don't think there are any messages here. Uh, any questions? I don't think there are. I just want so. Uh, I think it's so comprehensive that I really no you know areas where we can really ask any 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 questions. One particular thing which I want to emphasize that and Hemant also emphasized is when a patient comes to you, if you have a patient comes to you on a catheter, it is extremely important that we remove the catheter and even put the patient on a diaper uh, for 15 days, for a month, for it's okay to leak. So that area becomes, you know, becomes mature to do a surgery. 
to putting a catheter there keeps the bullous edema in place and then it becomes very difficult sometimes uh, to you know when you go around the tissue is still friable the second point of course is to wait how long to wait uh, is a is a is a billion dollar question uh, but i feel at least more than in a in a, in a vvf uh, maybe more than 3 months at least uh, it depends sometimes longer but at least 3 months i have operated on on vvf which are earlier than that and it becomes very dicey the tissues are very friable at least in 5 weeks 6 weeks it's never recommended that you go in at that point any 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 final comments uh, no i think uh... i was not allowed to unmute navneet they, they they are messaging me that they are not allowed to put questions on the chat box why is that navneet yes sir the they are messaging me that they are not allowed to put questions on the chat box why is that blocked oh sir it is open sir no i also try it was disabled So well, I was not allowed to unmute because you logged out and then logged in. No, no. Hemant, it was a wonderful talk, very comprehensive coverage of the psychovision fistula. But uh, I have a question: What is yes. this? What is the role of minimally invasive surgeries in genitourinary fistula? Are they going to replace the open surgery? yes sir i think sir uh, open surgery uh, like open abdominal surgery because this vaginal vaginal repair is again a minimal invasive surgery so uh, uh, i think it will the 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 simple the simple vvf like if we talk about vvf so i think 95% of our cases we do by vaginal route and it is the most minimal invasive option i can think of and then it will be a laparoscopic but then it will be a complicated so maybe we require a open surgery so it's for us it is either a vaginal repair or a open repair very rarely for academic reason we sometime do a laparoscopic uh, repair i Could suppose you require dr hemant that uh, that the ideal way to go proceed would be a, a vaginal one and um, a laparoscopic or a robotic it's nice uh, uh, but it's a far more expensive way of doing the doing a more invasive surgery yes sir so so for academic reasons we can do but it's <laughs> never required like it's very rarely required <clears throat> like open open we will only do if it there is a we want to do a concomitant diuretic reimplanting that we can do by robot laparoscopy or robotic also and if you want, like in my hand if you I, I want to do augmentation cystoplasty for a very complicated obstructed labor injury complex so in that case and there will it will be a very long standing vvf of 8 to 10 years sometime patient in a government setup of the, those sort of patient also come like they are they are they are obstructed injury complex for 8 years 10 years so that patient is generally with a small capacity bladder because all the urine she is leaking so they 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 become a dysfunctional bladder so in that case we need a augmentation cystoplasty that may be a reason of failure if we don't do augmentation at that point of time the the other issue which you addressed was the for the gynecological fistula obstetrics it's very clear for the gynecological fistula the early versus late repair that controversy still remains there what what are the criteria which you, which you take to decide that yes i would do an early repair i would not wait for 4 to 6 weeks for it to mature when would you say that i would do an early repair sir um, only the best time is intraoperative second thing is if i am suspecting a urethrovaginal fistula for urethrovaginal fistula i always do a early repair because that can be easily managed for a vasicovaginal fistula if the call is there in first 1 to 2 days and there is a there is a significant leak there is no controversy there is a significant like first post operative day entire there is nothing coming from bladder entire thing is leaking so there is a open bladder that can be repaired within 48 hours so in that case but that is very rare that i have not seen even in uh, like 8 years of government practice i have never seen that sort of call so uh, for even if, if there is a urethrovaginal for intraoperative is best then urethrovaginal fistula we do early repair for a suspected vvf it is if we are suspecting a very large vvf and within 48 hours we'll do early repair otherwise all our repair we do elective delay like after 3 to 6 months 
even if they force us we will not go in and will try to repair because often we have seen that surgeons have operated and they they invariably fail so how would you address patients who come with recurrent vvfs so sir recurrent vvf one thing is again we will examine the patient we will uh, uh, like see for the for first you sir what i see is what is the location of vvf how i will operate the patient and what were the causes of failure that is very important whether it was a uh, like the it was a uh, vvf which has to be operated abdominally and they have operated vaginally or vice versa whether it was done in a peripheral center like if it, it was done in a good central institute so i'll definitely i'll try to change my approach from a vaginal to abdominal and abdominal to vvf uh, vaginal it was done some by, by in a peripheral setup with a, uh, by a like not that experienced surgeon i'll i'll just operate on the merit of fistula if it is uh, if i can operate uh, comfortably in a from a vaginal side i'll do a vaginal vvf additionally i will always use a interposition graft in such cases and uh, what time i should operate is sir i examine the patient when there is no signs of inflammation it is a mature fistula that time i operate it is very important is a uh, opd there is a per speculum examination if the vagina is not healthy on cystoscopy it is a mature fistula we wait for one more month when they become a mature fistula vagina epithelium is healthy there is no skin excoriation that time we operate are there any questions from the residents it's been an absolutely wonderful uh, presentation by dr hemant and uh, uh, i think there are nothing uh, that is yeah there's a question here does the bladder capacity decrease after repair uh, well i think it tends to come back uh, yes, that's never a problem increases. in fact it increases because now the bladder yes, is it's getting... never a problem it never a problem because all the edema everything reduces and the type of collagen changes how does the epithelial tract heal if not excised uh, sir it is actually uh, we when we don't excise what i have told, uh, told in my presentation also we take the vaginal epithelium we take the part of fistula the tract right. and uh, and bladder and epithelium and in second layer we take sutures in such a way that it invaginates the first layer correct so, so i think that that it will it will not heal but it will be a watertight closure correct and it tends to and it tends to do well yeah yeah it tends to do well because that is it's not excised but it is but definitely disrupted yes sir so because when we do all this it's it's definitely disrupted it's not uh, that you excise it out but definitely disrupted so the the continuity is not there after the repair the mm-hmm. other question that is there uh, is which suture material do you preserve, do you prefer i prefer vicryl 2o or 3o vicryl 2o to 2o generally and it is a taper point i don't like round body because round body will stretch the tissues like they do more harm so the taper point which i prefer uh, vicryl 2o would you consider using pds uh, generally i have never used it <laughs> used it sir generally i always use vicryl 2o sometimes i use vicryl 3o but taper point that i make a point i never use round body at uh, okay. in any of the reconstructive surgeries in fact i think other options are using pds uh, 3040 and maxon these are the two other you know long term uh, absorbable sutures that can be used i'm uh, so i think I'm that is the last question there are no more questions okay. it's a very comprehensive talk there's not much gap for questions thank you so much for a wonderful talk dr hemant it's great pleasure having you and uh, i would like to thank dr Dr. Keshav Murthy, for finding the time uh, to spare to join us today. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And, uh, thank you, Hemant. Any final for, comments, sir, from you? Thank you, Hemant, for your time. You have taken a lot of effort to comprehensively cover the genital urinary fistula. I am sure the residents would have benefited with it. And thank you, Arvind, for moderating the session. Thanks a lot. Thank you sir. all. On that thank note, we will leave. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.